Okay, and I'm uh, going to let you know about our uh, next webinar, which will take place on June 9th at uh, 10 a.m. like today, and it will be on the topic of addressing open science in EU projects, and we will post the link to the registration in the chat for you. But uh, let's go ahead and start with our today's topic, licenses uh, for research data. So first, uh, let me introduce uh, our speakers. Uh, we have Vanessa Hannesleger, who will uh, talk to you about the benefits of open science and open licensing. Vanessa is a digital humanist with a focus on modern Austrian literature. She teaches uh, digital humanities at the University of Vienna and is also a postdoc at the German Literary Archives in Marbach. She is co-chair of the Daraya Working Group Ethics and Legality in Dig Digital Arts and Humanities and also a vice chair of the Claren Legal and Ethical Issues Committee. She was also involved in the Open Science Network Austria or OANA till 2021, where she focused on sustainability and reusability of research data. So after Vanessa's talk, we will move to Daniel Spichtinger, who will um, give you an overview about Creative Commons licensing in Horizon 2020 data management plans. Daniel is an independent expert working on open science, including open access and data management policies. From 2012 to 2018, he was also a member of the Open Science Unit in the European Commission's Directorate General for Research and Innovation. Since his return to Vienna in 2018, he has been working as an independent specialist on open science and EU research policy. He also advises the Ludwig Boltzmann Gesellschaft, where he works part-time and advises uh, on EU third-party funding. So now uh, I'm going to go a uh, gift word to uh, Vanessa. Stop sharing. Okay. Vanessa, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, if you notice that I'm uh, not professionally sitting in a chair, but comfortably lying on a couch, then that is due to the fact that I broke my leg. So um, that's why I'm sort of in a lying position here today. Uh, I am happy to see uh, a few familiar um, names more than faces. So hi, all that I haven't seen in a while. Uh, nice to see you. Um, and I will be giving you a hopefully short introduction to the benefits of uh, open science and open licensing. Um, I'm saying hopefully short because I never managed that. So um, I already uh, asked Teresa to stop me if I um, if I uh, come into the zone of you know running kind of long. So uh, let's dive right in. What I want to do uh, today is give you first a, a definition of open to sort of uh, speak about um, the origins of of everything then uh, go over to uh, a quick definition of open science which i will keep very short um, so that um, we don't lose time for our for our main focus which is going to be open licensing but this is sort of a, a package that comes uh, together and with good reason as i hope you will understand by the by the end of this so let's start with the definition of the very basics um, to understand open licensing we first need to understand where the idea of openness originally comes from so uh, where where we first find um, open as a concept is in in the open definition or not first but this is where where we take it from uh, for uh, today's purposes. And the open definition says that open means that anyone can freely access, uh, use, modify and share for any purpose, uh, whatever it is that we want to qualify at most. And uh, the only uh, requirements that may be attached to something that we define as open um, shall uh, be requirements that preserve 
uh, provenance on the one hand, um, that is important to remember, so keep that in mind, and uh, that preserve the openness itself. So that is also um, uh, an important aspect that we will encounter again when we come to the more practical side of things. Um, the whole idea of opening something up comes originally from the field of programming, software development, because uh, if you're familiar with the internet and how it is built at all, um, I am not very much, um, but uh, I guess uh, some of you here might be might be much more uh, fluent in in that than I am. Um, but if you're if you're familiar with how code works in principle then you uh, will immediately understand that writing code does not work if you're not able to uh, integrate to work with the code that already exists. So the only way to program is to um, build on something that is already there. Um, and this is, this is how uh, the idea of openness uh, came up. So open source is actually the origin of all that uh, open has turned into. So um, the fields that we in, in the field of research are most familiar with are, of course, open access and um, subsequently open science. But where it all came from is actually the open source movement. So that is, that is also uh, important to understand. Um, and other, in, in terms of when, when we talk about cultural heritage, about any sort of um, cultural and, and creative content, um, another important um, area or another important project to mention in the field of openness is the open content project and the definition of free cultural work so that we will uh, encounter again uh, a little down the road as well. Now, uh, building on this, let's take a very brief look at what open science is. So what is open science? It's just science done right. This is um, a sticker and a, a saying that was um, that someone uh, came up with who is unfortunately no longer with us. Um, uh, one of the pioneers of the of the open science movement, John Tennant. Um, what this what this uh, nice sticker is supposed to to say is that open science in the sense of um, publishing everything, every element of the science that we make or the research that we make. So the alternative term to open science is, as you're of course aware, uh, open scholarship, which also covers the humanities, which is where I come from. So that's important for me that you know that uh, that, that is also uh, an element in open science. Um, so when, when we speak about doing science openly, uh, we have to do it properly, because if we want to publish every element, every step down the road in our research process, then we have to do it much more uh, orderly and, and properly than when we just uh, do our research for ourselves on our own and only publish the results. So uh, that, is, that is one uh, side of this, of this saying, open science is just science done right. So if you uh, do it properly, if you do proper documentation, which you should, if you're a proper um, serious researcher, do anyway, uh, then um, this is this is what what really um, makes open science. So that is sort of the the ideological um, field where it comes from. But of course, um, there is a more more practical side to what open science is. Um, and that will lead us over uh, to the field of, of open licensing. So open licensing is not per se an element of open science, but more um, a medium, let's say, uh, that enables open science. And what I show, show you here is the open science taxonomy that the Foster Project came up with. And uh, that demonstrates how many fields, how many elements there are to this bigger concept of open science and how you uh, put them together to, to make your personal definition of what open science can mean for the concrete research that you do um, is uh, in the end um, up to you and up to your needs. But the main elements, and you should um, have heard them, and I'm sure you have, um, but just to, to recap, are uh, on the one hand um, the big field of open access that you're of course uh, familiar with that deals with uh, all types of publications. Um, 
the field of open data, which is uh, where where we actually want to put our focus today with the licensing of open data or of research data. Um, and then we, of course, also have um, various various elements like um, um, like um, the the open reproducible research or the whole field of evaluation where open metrics plays a role. Um, so as you can see in this taxonomy, open science is a huge field, um, and so we shouldn't we shouldn't just reduce it to the to the um, let's say um, hard fact elements that are, um, for instance, open access and open data, but we should also extend our understanding of openness to the field of workflows, to the field of documentation. So that's, uh, that's what, what this is uh, supposed to remind you of. But um, enough of the introduction, let's get down to business. Uh, what we want to talk about today is open licensing, and um, we have covered uh, the area of open and how that might tie into the into the story. So um, let's uh, quickly take a look at the basics of licensing. Um, what is a license? Um, let's start from the bottom to the top. A license is um, that is a saying of my um, valued uh, chair of the Clarin Legal Issues Committee, uh, Pavel Kamotsky. Uh, a license is basically a formalized promise not to sue. Um, you are all familiar with contracts and a contract is something that a person makes with another person or maybe a legal entity. So a contract is between two parties or between more parties. They agree on something, they make a contract, they write it down and then it counts. A license is the same thing, just that you don't have a, a partner in the license. A license is a... Um, let's say a contract that you make with the world where you define uh, what you agree on, what others may do with your stuff. And um, by using a license, by attaching a license to whatever content it is that you're licensing, you're promising not to sue anyone who adheres to the conditions that you defined in the license. So that is what a license is. Now, what can be licensed? Um, anything that qualifies as a work in, in the sense of copyright um, or uh, has an ex auxiliary right attached to it, such as a database right. Um, so uh, licensing also applies to data. Um, so you can license works and uh, data collections, data sets, if you own the rights to them. If you're not actually the rights owner, uh, you can't actually license. So that is an important aspect that, that, you have to, that you have to consider. For instance, if you have a data collection of um, 18th century paintings from Italy, I'm just making things up, um, that are already in the public domain, then you will have to uh, make sure to uh, consider if, if you actually can license your data collection, because if there are no rights attached to the data that you have collected, because they are, for instance, in the public domain, then you should actually not put a license on them, because that would mean um, making something that is very openly accessible, accessible under uh, more restricted conditions, and that is something that we want to avoid. Um, also, what cannot be licensed are raw data, let's say measurement data, let's say uh, what the, the ZAMG um, measures every day, the weather and the temperatures, the raw data um, cannot actually be put under a license because data are facts and facts are not intellectual creations. Um, one other important element to be considered when licensing things is as I said, you can only license what you own the rights to. So uh, if uh, contracts with publishing houses, if contracts with the university that employs the researchers say otherwise, um, then maybe there could be a condition that disables licensing. So that is also an important thing to consider. Now, there is one best license. And uh, I'm sure you all know it. And uh, in order to find out if you do, we have prepared a tiny little questionnaire for you. And I am going to uh, ask Teresa to put the link in the chat. Uh, and I'm going to ask all of you 
uh, to participate in this Mentimeter. Um, you can find the link in the chat now. Uh, and you're going to be asked to name uh, a license that, that you're familiar with. I'm going to stop screen sharing now. Um, and um, I'm asking you uh, to just put in whatever comes to mind. And uh, I want you to list the most common license that you know first, because that will help me make my point. Don't be shy. Ooh, wow. Thank you very much. Um, that is that is already enough to make my point. <laughs> As you can see, uh, the uh, most frequently Thank you, that is excellent. That works very excellently the way I expected it. Uh, wow, you are all very familiar with a, a lot of stuff. So um, I'm, I'm wondering if I'm actually telling you anything new, but you are also very excellently making my point, which is that Creative Commons, as you can see from, from this quick survey, are obviously the by far best known um, and most widely known licenses. Thank you, um, Teresa. I will uh, take over the screen again, if I may. Um, here. Oops. Can you see my slides? Yes, okay. Um, so uh, you, you very excellently made my point that, and my point being that you are all uh, familiar or a lot of you are very familiar with the Creative Commons. Um, the best license is the best known license. That's why Creative Commons is the best license or the Creative Commons licenses are the best licenses. Uh, why is that? Um, licenses are actually, uh, so the basis of a license, of a proper license, is a binding legal text. However, um, most people who want to or have to use licenses are not lawyers. Also me, I'm not a lawyer. I cannot read um, or I cannot uh, read in a qualified way a legal text. Uh, and I'm expecting neither can most of you. So. Uh, the problem with that is if you have a license with a very proper and very eloquent legal text that defines everything that can and can't be done with the licensed content, then that will have the effect that uh, it might be legally very solid, but uh, cannot be understood by anyone uh, and therefore does not help in communicating what uh, the license actually enables. And that is bad because a license is supposed to make it easily understandable for everyone who might be interesting, interested in using a licensed content to what uh, they are actually allowed to do with that content. And that is why Creative Commons are the best licenses. I'm sparing you all the, um, the advertising block why Creative Commons is so great and where it comes from. Um, because I'm, I'm running out of time, I think. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, the open content project that we mentioned in the beginning when we talked about the definition of openness is also something that uh, actually uh, grew into the Creative Commons. So it has quite a long history, is already um, 20 years old. Now, the um, four elements to Creative Commons licenses uh, that uh, can be combined almost completely freely are on the one hand attribution, so that's the buy element, share alike or copy left, that's the SA element that basically says you can do anything with my stuff, um, you can edit it, change it, but you have to share it under the same condition as I shared it, so you have to reuse the license that I used. Then there is the element no derivative, so that says um, you can um, work with my stuff and use it, but you can not change it. And then there is the element non-commercial, so that says you can reuse my stuff and do whatever, but uh, you cannot make money off it. Uh, one thing I also have to mention is the public domain mark and the CC0 license. Uh, 
both basically say this is a work without any rights attached to it, but they don't say it in the same way, and it's important to understand the difference. So the public domain mark says this work does not have any rights attached to it. I know this, and I would like to share this knowledge with the world. That is why I am marking this work uh, as a work that is in the public domain. For instance, the Mona Lisa. Um, the CC0 license, on the other hand, says, I am a person who owns the rights to a work, for instance, this very cute selfie of me with a Krapfen. Um, and I think that this work should go out in the world and be freely reused by anyone who wants to reuse it under whatever terms they want to do. They don't even have to attribute me as the creator of this uh, great work. So I am uh, giving my work that I own the rights to uh, out to the world and I am um, refraining from all rights that I have to this work. So that is uh, an important difference. Thank you, Teresa. I have one minute. Um, I just had to, to make that clear because I put the photos on the slide and so I, I have to explain what, they, what they're supposed to mean. Um, okay, so uh, the, as I said, the Creative Commons modules can be combined almost completely freely with each other. Um, as you can see from this table, the only two elements that do not go together are the uh, share alike module and the no derivatives module. And that is for a, just for a logical reason. Uh, the share alike module says, if you modify my stuff, you can do anything that you want, but you have to reshare it under the same condition, whatever new creation it is that you make. The no, no derivatives module says you can't change it. You can do whatever, but you can't change it. So if you can't change it, you are also not creating any new content that could have to be shared under the same condition. That is why these two uh, do not go together. Other than that, all the CC modules can be freely combined with each other. Um, and in this table, you can easily see what is most open and therefore the best and uh, what is most closed and therefore not such a good idea. Uh, there are, of course, good reasons for uh, all restrictions that the Creative Commons enable. And if you would like to talk a little bit more about possible reasons for that, I'm happy to do that uh, in the discussion round. I'm not introducing you to the public license selector because you have the link on the slides and you can try it out yourself um, or ask me to talk about it in the discussion session. And like this, I think I almost managed a proper time management. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for uh, the lovely talk and the introduction to open licensing. And uh, now before we move to our next speaker, we have a question for all of you. Um, and I've just started a little poll um, to ask you how familiar you are with licensing requirements in Horizon 2020. And I already see a lot of answers coming in. Oh, that's quick. Okay. Um, I'm gonna give it a couple more seconds. If you wanna add your answer. Okay, I don't see anyone clicking any options anymore. So I think, right, there we go. So uh, as we see, um, most of you are somewhere in the middle and you're a little familiar with the licensing requirements in Horizon 2020. Just four of you answered that you're very familiar um, with uh, these requirements, which actually is perfect for our next talk. And uh, I'm sure that after Daniel's uh, presentation, all of you will be at least in the little or uh, very area of the poll. So Daniel, uh, go ahead. So thank you very much, um, Teresa, for inviting me and also uh, to Vanessa for the first presentation, because I think it's nicely complimentary. Um, so I will share the screen and uh, I hope you can all see it. Yeah, thank you, Teresa gives me the hands up. Um, just a moment, so that's where we start. So uh, in my presentation, we go a lot more into the details of uh, 
not only what the requirements are in Horizon, but also um, what is the practice. So I'm going to compare the new program, Horizon Europe, with the old program, uh, Horizon 2020. And it builds on previous research about Horizon 2020 data management plans, where maybe we can uh, present this underlying research at another time. And then I looked at this into more detail and I actually focused in on the licensing. So uh, just some definitions about, you know, what we consider research data. There's of course a huge variety of data in the social sciences and humanities, in the natural sciences, um, but an increasing trend to see data as an inherent, inherently valuable product of scientific research rather than as a byproduct. Um, so uh, we already heard a lot about open science and I also want to put the whole licensing discussion in the context of FAIR data, which probably most of you will know is not just the word FAIR, but an acronym for findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. Um, and here under the reusable criteria, here it's where the licensing plays an important role um, because it basically tells other people what they are allowed to do with the data. So if they can reuse it and under what conditions, and we already heard uh, the definition of the different licenses and uh, uh, in my a certificate that I did with Creative Commons, I think it was nicely explained as saying that uh, copyright is, uh, and sometimes you also see that, right? Uh, you see copyright and then it says all rights reserved, while in Creative Commons, there are only some rights reserved. And basically you, or if we presume that you are the person giving the license, you decide uh, which rights you reserve and which you basically allow uh, to, to waiver in a way. Um, and here we have again, this list of Creative Commons licenses. Basically the two important distinctions are, do I allow commercial exploitation or not? Yeah, With CC BY being the most liberal license where you can do basically everything as long of course, as you give proper credit, non-commercial allowing uh, reuse, but not for commercial purposes, um, share alike, allowing research reuse if you provide the same conditions under which you um, access the material, reuse the material. And no derivative means, you know, you cannot actually make something new out of it. Um, so the most liberal Creative Commons being CC BY and the most restricted Creative Commons being uh, CC BY non-commercial, non-derivative, uh, and you could even add here uh, share alike. So moving then into uh, the EU programs, because that's my speciality sort of usually looking at open science in the context of the EU activities. Um, and here we can see um, an evolution, yeah, the, 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 the nice uh, saying of evolution not revolution uh, from Horizon 2020 to Horizon Europe where in Horizon 2020, um, at the time I was still there, we started with an open research data pilot, which was then extended to the whole program, but always um, with the possibility to opt out uh, under certain conditions, if there is the need to, uh, uh, license, to, to, to uh, protect IP or if it's personal data, for instance. And you know, as in Europe, this has just been uh, further developed. Um, now every project needs to do a DMP, but you can opt out of making data open, but you cannot opt out of making a DMP, but you use your data management plan uh, if you want to justify why you need to keep some data closed. And we also see, and this is what is relevant for today, um, a stricter, stricter approach towards licensing. So in Horizon 2020, there was a recommendation to provide what is called an appropriate Creative Commons licenses. And they mentioned CC BY and the CC0 tool with metadata uh, CC0. And now in Horizon Europe, uh, if you provide data open access or open, 
then you need to use a CC BY, CC zero, or equivalent, they say. Except, of course, if you can justify not doing so in the DMP. Um, there's also the um, provision for CC BY or CC zero for publications, but that's not something I'm going to go in in this session because we are focusing on data. So um, I did this study as part of my certificate on Creative Commons, where I actually look at what do Horizon 2020 projects say about the Creative Commons licensing for their data and what does this potentially mean for Horizon Europe? Um, so actually I haven't really published that uh, in, a, in, a, in a publication, but it was this final project for the Creative Commons certificate. So as I said, I built on this collection of 840 publicly available data management plans. So uh, as Teresa notes, this was from a previous project and we put them on Fedra. So if you wanna look at data management plans from Horizon 2020, you can find them there, but to say they are not quality screen. So it's basically, you know, whatever the project says was the data management plan. So you can find good ones, you can find some which are not so good. And from this previous project, you can find some of my conclusions about this more general analysis on Open Research Europe. Um, so then I proceeded in the second uh, study, I proceeded to look at which of these 840 data management plans mention Creative Commons, and then what specific licenses are being mentioned. Um, I just see some questions, but I guess we are going to go into them at the end. Um, so basically, I first did an automated uh, check for the licenses, yeah, for, for keywords about Creative Commons. And then I manually checked uh, whether this was actually appropriate, because in some documents, for instance, it could say we are not using Creative Commons. Yeah? And then it would still be flagged up in the automated search because Creative Commons was mentioned. So it was necessary to go through it um, uh, by hand. So this was uh, actually quite an effort. Findings. So from the 840 DMP, about 36%, uh, they contain some reference to Creative Commons. Um, and so when we look at more detail, what do they say? You could call it uh, a thousand flowers blooming. Uh, namely that there are very, very different approaches in Horizon 2020. Some projects define a policy for the whole project. Others basically say how you license your data set, it's really up to the individual project partners because those partners are the owners of the results. So they decide how to license it. In other cases, they, the project gave the partners a choice between different CC licenses. And uh, in one case, the CC license was only given to jointly owned results. So if it was uh, more than one partner cooperating. Um, in many cases, in fact, there was not one license for the whole project, uh, but a different number of them. And you know, how did, they, how did the projects choose which licenses to apply? There were very different uh, rationales you know, uh, sometimes a bit bizarre according to, uh, from my point of view, uh, according to um, the data format, for instance. Um, and in, in some cases, uh, more restrictive licenses were used for commercially sensitive data. And in other cases, such data was not opened at all. Uh, findings uh, con continued. In many cases, the, in the DMP, the phrasing was quite vague. So they said, okay, we will use Creative Commons licenses where appropriate, where possible, where justified. And often they say, okay, we will use a Creative Commons license, but they actually don't tell you which one. Um, in some cases also, uh, that's what I mentioned before, the license choice was based on the output or the data format or the presumed target groups. In many cases, there was no prescription in the DMP, but rather a recommendation to use a specific license to the project partners. And in several cases, the DMP just said, we are discussing that at the moment, but we haven't really decided yet what we are going to do. 
Um, and then a number of DMPs, so this is a bit, uh, uh, got a bit uh, critical eye for me. They basically just quote what the EC guidelines say without actually indicating what approach the project has chosen. And in a number of projects, the wording was very similar, uh, separate projects. They all had to do their own DMP. But if the wording is very similar, this indicates that somebody was using a template. Um, so basically, I then did some quantitative analysis. And here are the parameters for that. I think I have five minutes, so I will not really go into this a lot in detail. But it was basically, how did I count yeah, what license uh, is, is admissible? Um, so here are the results. And I'm going to show you the same statistics in two different uh, graphics. So this is the first graphic. And I think we can already see a clear, if we want, winner, the CC BY license. So the most um, uh, liberal of the Creative Commons licenses. And here we see this, these are the same results in a different uh, graphic, pie chart graphic. So we can see exactly half of those that mention licenses use Creative Commons license. So my conclusions would be, um, if you use the German word, there's a wild books. Yeah? So basically, um, among uh, the data management plans, only 36% mention Creative Commons. And among those that do, there is this wild books. So you can translate it. It comes from uh, botany. And this is also why there's the picture on the left. Uh, there is like uncontrolled development that's uh, looked up what, how to translate wild books into English. So there's a lot of variety of approaches with rather vague verdicts. But among those that do mention specific CC, CC grade, uh, Creative Commons licenses, the CC BY license emerges as the clear favorite. Uh, if we want to look at what's the least favorite, CC BY ND, yeah, so non-derivative, is the least favorite license. Now, we didn't really do interviews in this project. So we don't know why, but I could imagine that creative, creating derivatives is actually often used in scientific research, right? So you basically use data, reuse data in your own research as a baseline, as a comparison to your own data. So you actually need to create a derivative. And maybe people are aware of that. So that's why for scientific, we use to say ND is the least favorite license. Um, a number of licenses chosen actually restrict commercial reuse. So here, maybe these are speculations, also a bit the scientific uh, ethos that, you know, okay, other scientists can reuse our research, but um, we, don't, we don't actually want commercial entities to reuse that. CC0 is not very popular. Um, and here we find a little bit uh, methodological problems that uh, even those CC0 licenses that are counted, that are mentioned, they are most often for metadata and not for the main data. What does this mean for Horizon Europe? And then I'm at the end. So, you know, all this data is from data management plans from Horizon 2020, because Horizon Europe is still quite new. So we don't have that many data management plans certainly not from the end of projects. So um, basically, only 36% of data management plans mentioning Creative Commons, that's a bit worrying, even though in Horizon Europe, uh, in Horizon 2020, so it was only a recommendation. It was not mandatory. But it still means um, a lot of projects in Horizon 2020 were not familiar with uh, these licenses or they did not consider them relevant. And that indicates a need for further training and awareness raising. And the need for further training and awareness raising that often comes up uh, when we talk about data management in Horizon. Um, so basically, when we look at those, and here I have to be careful how I word this, that do mention Creative Commons licenses, uh, and we count CC BY and CC0, basically 60% would be compliant with the Horizon Europe requirements, because in Horizon Europe, CC BY or CC0 is mandatory or equivalent, except if you can convincingly demonstrate why not. 
but that's only out of those that actually mentions licensing. Yeah, so it's not correct to say that 60% of Horizon 2020 DMPs are compliant, in the sense that most of them actually don't mention Creative Commons. So Horizon Europe mandate is in a way useful in that it does away with the vague formulation, you know, the non-binding recommendations that we find in the data management plans in Horizon 2020, because now they clearly say it has to be CC BY or CC zero. But it also has its own problems because what happens with all the uh, content that in Horizon 2020 was licensed, CC BY, share alike, CC BY and C, blah, blah, blah. Yeah? So, 60% or 50% are compliant, but what with the other 40%? And here we have two choices. Either in the future, they will switch to CC BY or CC zero because it's mandatory, or they just say, well, you know, if I can decide between CC BY or CC zero, I don't make it open at all. Uh, and we justify this in the DMP. And that I think is not a good, that would not be a good outcome because I'd rather have something available under a more restrictive license than uh, completely closed off. And with that, I think Teresa, I am in time. Uh, so if you have more questions, um, we can discuss them now. We have a question sessions, but also feel free to contact me under my contacts. And uh, I think the, the presentation will be circulated. So I'm going to stop the screen sharing. Um, and maybe, I don't know, maybe I could, uh, I could uh, answer the first question from the chat, if that's okay, Teresa. Of course. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Daniel, for the lovely presentation. Uh, let's have a look at the chat. I think we have a few questions coming in. Thank you, Vanessa, for joining us for the Q&A session. Um, Right, so we have a question for Daniel. Is there an official source where to retrieve the information about the DMP and uh, CC requirements for Horizon Europe projects? Okay. Thank you. So the requirements, if you just want to know the requirements, they are on the Horizon Europe website, the participant portal. Um, there is, in Horizon 2020, there was a separate guide now it's been included into, uh, I think it was called a strategic planning document where you have them, but I think they should also be on the website. Uh, you can also download DMPs. So where did I get all these Horizon 2020 DMPs? You can download them from CORDA, so from the official commission warehouse, but only those DMPs that have been made available publicly. So it was also the uh, consortium also can decide whether they want to provide the DMPs publicly or not. And if they are, if they say we make it public, then you can help them. All right, thank you, Daniel. Uh, I see there was a question for Vanessa. You answered it in the chat as well, but do you wanna perhaps say a little bit more about it? Uh, yes, if, if there are no more pressing questions, um, I'm happy to elaborate. So the question was, um, if uh, actually data collections qualify as works according to the Austrian Urheberinnenrecht. Um, and the answer is, um, and I am not a lawyer, but I have learned as much from lawyers in, in the uh, past years co cooperating with them that the right answer is always, it depends. Um, so uh, it, per data collections per se, can be different things according to uh, um, copyright law. So for um, on the one hand, a, a collection of data can have a complex structure that actually required some original creation. So what is what is relevant to the definition of a creation to qualify as a work according to the copyright law is um, if there was actually any intention and any sort of individual creativity involved. So that can be the case for data collections, especially for uh, complex research data collections. If that is the case, then a data base, a collection of data can qualify as a compilation work. So that's defined in Article 6 of the uh, copyright law in Austria. Um, that would also be true if you, for instance, if you publish a book that has like 10 articles by different people. So your 
even though if you did even though you yourself didn't write anything your way of compiling the articles together to form a proper book on a certain topic would be protected by this article 6 um, because your compilation qualifies as a work in itself and the same would be true for databases so that is the one thing that can apply but Often we also, as researchers, have to do with data collections that are where the structure is not really all that original. Say you collect uh, biographical data on Austrian writers of the 20th century, just to have some example. And you collect uh, names, birth dates, death dates, and um, I don't know, first novel, title of the first novel. So that would be uh, not a very creative way of compiling data, right? Um, but in that case, if you, for instance, come up with a data collection with, um, say, uh, 5,000 entries, 10,000 entries, then you would have made a substantial investment in order to gain your data collection. And if you made a substantial investment to create a database, then your uh, your database, even if it does not qualify as a work, is protected under the sui generis database right that is defined in Article 87 of the of the uh, copyright law. So uh, the protection period is uh, is uh, not as long. So that's only 20 years, I believe, uh, for which a database is protected under this right. But it basically so you don't have any intellectual rights attached to it, but you do have all the exploitation rights that are granted to you as the creator of a database. So that would be the two the two possibilities how data can can qualify uh, can can be protected by the copyright law maybe i can add something to that in a more general perspective because the, the database directive was mentioned uh, just uh, to point out that there's also a little bit of criticism because the database directive i think is from 1996 so from you know for the digital age <laughs> it's like millennium ago um, so there are also plans on, you know, reforming uh, the digital legislation in the EU. So for those interested, that's quite um, that's quite one of the priorities of the Commission. And it's maybe not so visible because there's always uh, some crisis happening. But uh, we all have the, you know, the Data Act. And uh, so if you're interested in that, I would advise you also to to follow a little bit what the EU does in the in the digital realm because uh, there are quite some efforts on the way. And, uh, you know, most people, if they think about data and the EU, they think about GDPR. But now they really go a step further and also to say, okay, you know, what about non-personal data? So, yeah, just a comment. Yeah, there are actually, um, if, if I may add to that, there are actually two important things happened in, in 2019 in, in that respect. So. Uh, the one thing that was uh, finally published with all um, uh, also um, uh, criticism that that has to be well important criticism that there was of this so there was the copyright directive uh, that the eu brought uh, underway finally in 2019 on the one hand and um, also very important um, but much and i think there was much much less public attention for that there was also published in 19 the directive on public sector information which was actually the first uh, piece of eu legislation that explicitly included uh, the concept of fair data as a requirement for for research data so since since the 2019 directive research data within the EU, eu is actually um supposed to be a uh, at least fair um if no if no reasons speak against that so there is that that's very important to note so there is a, a lot of very important um eu legislation being brought underway that also has to be of course uh, directives work different than 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 um, regulations such as the gdpr so when a directive is put into place then the member states first have to implement it in their national legislation so the process is a little slower um, but there is that there is a lot of uh, important stuff happening in that in that field and that also affects us as researchers so it's very um pleasant to see from the from the 2019 uh, directive that um, research data is actually explicitly mentioned and um, and also in, in in a very included in a very smart way so we we really see that the the EU understood 
um, the issues that come with with research data. So it's very it makes me very hopeful. Thank you so much, Vanessa and Daniel. Uh, I think we still have time for one or two more questions. Um, feel free to also unmute yourself if that's okay with you, or you can also obviously post your questions in the chat. And maybe if Vanessa also has a question, you know, it's like it's the first time I, I, I saw you were also uh, involved with Juana, but I don't think we met there. Um, <laughs> yes. We did, and I don't remember in that sense. Sorry if we did. Ah, we have someone. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you, Vanessa, for your uh, talk and for your explanation. Uh, we. Uh, you said in this question and answers around that you talked about databases and data collections. What about the each items of a database? I mean, if you have a data collection, it's, 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 it contains a lot of items, objects, mm. media objects. What about this single object of a collection? Uh, very, very good question. That uh, that's an issue that gives the or the issue that gives us the most headaches, right? The, so we have the collection on the one hand, but then we have the stuff in it, which is actually what makes the headache. That really, so um, it really, of course, it depends uh, on on the on the content that you're collecting. But of course, um, and, and that is also the big issue with with data collections. Um, each item in your collection is has its individual copyright status and that has to be considered so um all the for i mentioned the 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 um, public sector information directive and that it explicitly mentions research data and also now we have um thanks to the to the, the copyright directive we have the uh, enablement of text and data mining um and um whenever whenever we have legislation that speaks about data and what we can do with it then we very often encounter the little phrase uh as long as you have lawful access you can do maybe quite a lot of things as long as you have lawful access so um the the data and the items in your collection have to be there lawfully so you will actually have to uh, consider is the item in your collection in copyright and if it is uh, under what conditions are you allowed to share it under what conditions are you even allowed to have it and under what conditions are you allowed to share it so there is really um it, it, you would really you would have to tell me concretely what kind of item you have in mind to to so that i could give you a proper answer to that it unfortunately it is as tricky so the copyright for the item in the collection um, or any other right that might be attached to it does not go away just because the item was added to a collection. That is unfortunately the case. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the question and Vanessa for your answer. We have one more question in the chat. I think it's, we still have time for that one. Um, is a double licensing possible if I make an image Lichtbildwerk of a copyrighted work. Uh, <laughs> um, Question for the lawyers in the room that are not present. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, if the original, well, if the item that is included in the Lichtbildwerk is is itself protected by copyright, um, then. And, and you do not have any rights to, so if, if, if the item that you're trying to photograph and you're trying to make a, a Lichtbildwerk um, is still in copyright, then you're actually, and there is no license or anything attached to it, then if you're very strict, you're actually not even allowed to create the Lichtbildwerk. So um, if I were to take a selfie with a copyrighted, um, with, with a, a piece of art that is still under copyright, then that would actually, um, I would be allowed to take the picture and use it for my personal use, but I would not be allowed to publish it or add it to any sort of, any sort of collection. In, if you're taking the law seriously, of course, that is not implementable in, in, in practice and in the way that we uh, use museums as Instagram 
um, um, scenery uh, these days. But uh, in in fact, if you according to copyright, that would not be possible. Um, if if now the work that we're talking about that you're including in your Lichtbildwerk uh, would actually be licensed in a way that would allow you to uh, to make some sort of um, to to build upon it, so maybe you maybe it's a CC by SA uh, licensed um, sculpture. Let's say I'm making things up again. Um, then you would have to stick to the conditions that the original work and its licensing gives you. And if you were allowed to make derivatives, but uh, share the resulting uh, Lichtbildwerk under the same condition, then um, that these these requirements would apply. So that wouldn't be in that sense double licensing, but you would just build upon the license the way you would in, in any other, other context. Thank you so much, Vanessa. I think with that, we have, it's 11 o'clock and I think we are, are done with our webinar for today. I'm going to stop the recording.